Welcome to the Creating Well Simplified Podcast. My name is Lauren Wells, here with my co-host, Chris Seveny. We're committed to providing you with the knowledge required to build wealth through real estate investing. Tired of consuming content about real estate? Stuck in analysis paralysis? Ready to do your first deal? As a member of our community, you will learn how to go from consuming content to taking that first step into the world of real estate investing. Our show is not about getting rich quick, but about providing you with the knowledge you need to take action. Join us as we speak with experienced investors who share action tips on how to escape the corporate world, start a thriving side hustle in the world of real estate, and go beyond your W-2 or 401k. Welcome to the Creating Well Simplified podcast, where each week we bring you education and information that will help you take your next step in building wealth through real estate. My name is Lauren Wells, and I am joined here today by my co-host, Chris Seveny. And today we are going to talk about 7E for investors. Now, what does that mean? We want to talk about what you're investing in as an investor, like what, not just the underlying assets, but the team, the company, and what does that investor experience look like for people? So by, for example, Chris, <laughs> do you yeah. want to take it for a second? I'm like, still haven't had my second cup of coffee. And as you might tell, I am actually drinking tea because I am losing my voice a little bit today. Yes, my voice is going to sound a little froggish. I apologize. As Lauren mentioned about team, we just had our team retreat that we just got back from. I got in late last night from visiting sunny Santa Barbara, California. So thank you for hosting us, Lauren. And this morning it was 45 and rainy here. And I looked at my wife and said, you sure you don't want to move California? But as Lauren mentioned, what is our focus and what we like to term the double bottom line, which is providing a return for our investors and also attempting to give borrowers, you know, a second chance on their property. And we'll talk today, you know, how we do that as well as the investor experience for those investors on the transparency and the communication that we provide out to them. And today is also a special day because what is today, Lauren? Today is dividend day. I'm glad you said that because I made a note to be like, happy dividend day. So today, anyone who had invested as of August 31st received Mm -hmm. their first dividend or will be receiving today. It should hit your bank account today if it has not already. So on that note, I kind of want to talk about, okay, when you make a decision to invest with 70s and kind of even to back up a little bit further, if you're new to the podcast or joining in from us talking about how we're hosting this live, we have launched a regulation A plus offering that is aiming to provide 8% annually paid in monthly dividends while also trying to keep borrowers in their home and give them a second chance. So talking about when you making a decision to invest in 7E, you're making that active decision to start receiving monthly income while also supporting a team that is working to give families that second chance to stay in their homes. So Chris, I guess a little bit about kind of, we talk about active and passive a little bit. So Mm -hmm. I say you're making an active decision, but do you want to talk a little bit about like active and passive investing offerings? And I know we've talked about this Mm -hmm. in the past, but just to kind of give our investors or potential investors a kind of insight into how active is this? Well, for investors, it's considered passive. And active investments, first, let me start defining an active investment, and then we'll define passive and what this investment is. You know, active investment is when you may buy a piece of real estate, like a rental property. Even if you have a property manager on that piece of property, you still have to play an active role. You still have to be made a part of the decision-making process. So there's many different forms of real estate or other investments that you can invest in that you have to partake in that active role. In this fund, we'll use the term passive, excuse me, because it's more of what, you know, I'll use the term set it and forget it and or mailbox money, meaning invest in the fund and they will be buying shares of our company and all of the work is done by us and our team that we have behind the scenes. And then the only active role of an investor is just reviewing any statements and updates that we provide them and information during webinars, joining live podcasts. So it is something that we view this as a very passive investment for investors. 
Yeah. And I think that's super important to highlight because you talk about mailbox money, which is something you just said. And I think today there's a a lot of people who are saying, oh, you can invest in short-term rentals or multifamily or long-term buy and holds. And that's passive. But we just had someone on the podcast last week or two weeks ago that we had interviewed that was talking about how he started out doing that and then realized, you know, that's definitely not passive. You're not just collecting a check in the mail. You're actually managing properties, managing people. So when you invest with in 7E, you're really, it is that passive investment. You know, we're identifying the mortgage notes that we're going to acquire where we feel like we can have that impact. So when you're investing, you're not just investing in a passive way, but you're investing in social good as well. So I kind of want to talk about that component of keeping borrowers in their homes. And Mm -hmm. we operate a little bit more unique than I'd say most people in the industry. So Chris, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So because we buy distressed debt at a discount, it gives us more flexibility. And what I mean by that is it gives us flexibility to negotiate or redo the terms of the loan because a loan that is $100,000 loan that is at a 4% interest rate, one would think, oh, they're getting a 4% return. And people ask, well, how can you target 8% if a loan is originated at 4%? But if we're buying that loan for 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollar, and the borrower's payment was $1,000 per month, and we get them a new payment plan. And even if the payment was $900 a month, you know, times, now that's $10,000 now coming in the door based off of our lesser investment, not the full 100,000 that was still owed to us. It allows us to enhance our return without having to go out also and get leverage, which is one thing that I know we get talked, asked about a lot as well in regards to it's an unlevered return in that sense. And when we run the financial models on these assets, it's in the benefit of both parties, theirs typically and ours, to keep them in their home. Now, a lot of people think, oh, a bank, they just want to go in for clothes. Banks don't like owning real estate because it increases risk. And banks aren't built to manage real estate. One of the benefits that also I'd like to note to us as well is we all have real estate experience. So if we do take a property back, we are experienced to know how to manage it and handle it as well. Unlike, and we don't have the red tape that a large institutional lender will have. We have a team of nine of us at 7E that works together that would you know go through and manage to exit that asset. Yeah. And I think something that I want to clarify because it's a question I get asked all the time is, Am I investing in, can I see, am I investing in a specific note? Am I, am I investing in one note or am I investing in the pool of assets? Cause I know there are some funds or offerings where you're actually buying a piece of a property. So can you talk a little bit about how that works and like what the investor is investing in? So the investor, when they buy shares is investing in the company and the company will hold significant portfolio, primarily first position loans with a mix of performing and non-performing. We do not strictly buy 100% non-performing loans. We do balance off our portfolio. And by having hundreds, thousand loans in a portfolio versus one asset, to us, we view that as, again, risk mitigation. People invest in one multifamily deal, as an example, and I'm not by any ways knocking multifamily deals or any type of asset class. I'm just explaining the difference. It could be 300 apartment units, which each one function independently. But at the end of the day, your sole investment is on that one apartment building. So if there was issues with either re- refinancing it or the market in that area or to have trouble, your rest, all your eggs are in that one basket. Whereas we have, say we have a thousand loans spread throughout 30 or 40 states as well as buying at a discount. And many of these properties might have equity above the loan balance. For us, we look at that as risk mitigation, especially if there was potential any softening in the real estate market, because it gives us that greater cushion because of buying it A at a discount, again, being unlevered. Yeah. So something I want to shift to, because I feel like this is so important, is when you're investing in any company, any syndication fund, you're investing, yes, in the underlying asset, but you're also investing, like Chris just mentioned, in the company. And mm-hmm. I think people 
you do a lot of work on what's the risk of the investment. But like, what about the people behind? We've done maybe two episodes, I think, Chris, on you know questions to ask your sponsors and before investing with them. And then questions I get as a sponsor, you should be prepared to answer. So obviously, I am, feel very passionately about not only taking a look at the assets and the track record of the team, but also like who's the team in place. Like once I give you my money, okay, yes, that's awesome that 8% and you're helping families stay in their home. But like, what does that communication look like? Are you just going to go dark on me? Am I, what does that look like? So I kind of want to talk about the investor experience from my perspective and having invested in other funds. And then Chris kind of going back and forth together on this. So when you choose to invest with 70, you know, you're investing in a company that is going to you know, have a ton of mortgage notes. You're investing in that entire company in their portfolio that is aiming to keep borrowers in their home and work out some sort of loss mitigation plan with them. Now you do invest, what does that communication look like? So we have a team of investor relations, investor relations team, which is headed up. I don't even know, am I saying that? Led by you. Led by, (laughs) led by, oh my goodness. It's a Monday morning, guys. Been on the road for two weeks, so bear with me. Led by Katie who, and she essentially is the go-to contact for all investors. And she is someone that you can actually email. You can call. I think a big part of the investor experience is knowing that if you pick up the phone or send an email, you're going to get one, a response within 24 hours. You'll probably get a response. I'm setting our SLA here, Katie. So you're going to get a timely response and it's going to be from an actual person, not any sort of bot or automated press one to speak this, Mm -hmm. press two to speak this, pick up the phone and call. You're going to speak with a person. And I think that is as an investor myself, that's something that I always want to know that I'm speaking with an actual person who has eyes on the assets, who is very involved. Yeah. I want to add a few things to that because we just came back from a conference and one of the things that I think sets us apart, be completely point blank, is our staff is not outsourced. We were talking with other investors and some other funds, and they're outsourcing their staff to other countries and different places, which there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, again, not knocking it. I'm just comparing ours where our staff is, they're all employees. They're all in the continental 48 states. Uh, Most of them are in California. I'm on the East Coast. But we have that staff. And like you said, it's not automated or it's not a call center where they like, oh, we'll just take a you know name and number and someone will get back to you. You will speak to somebody who is an employee of 70 and the numbers we give are the people who will know the answers. Or if they don't know the answer, they will get back to you in a very quick and timely fashion to answer those questions that they do provide. And I do think that is something that is important. Our staff is roughly just under 10 people. Everyone is very experienced as part of our staff, especially on not only asset management side, but also that investor relations side that you work with as well. So it's something that they understand the process. Our investor relations team also is invested in this offering as well. I want to also experience it from both sides. So I think that's also something that is important that we provide. So it's not only how are they performing, but they almost can see and judge themselves by how they're performing as well. Man, I should have taken notes because I have so many thoughts on what you just said. And I do my normal Lauren thing where I forget them as I go. So next time I'm going to be typing notes on, oh, wait, I want to say this. But to start, the first thing that you said, we were at a conference in the last week. And I, how many times did we mention our team as like yeah. our superpower as what sets us apart? I mean, I'd say every conversation it came up because this is unique you know, open to accredited and non-accredited investors. And our minimum is $500. So you have people who are like, oh man, how do you manage so many investors? That sounds like it would be a nightmare. And I'm like, no, we have a super experienced team, not only has real estate experience, but they also have systems and processes experience from previous careers. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, I don't even bat an eye at this. I'm excited that we have such a great team to support all of our investors. And then the second thing to that is on that note, I'm trying to remember all the things that when you were talking, I wanted to highlight. The second thing is we're always iterating and making things better. So for example, 
right now when we onboard investors, they go through the investment flow. And then we noticed that there was kind of this lull between them making an investment and then receiving access to their investor portal. Now, what we've done, you know, we've received a few emails and we realized this is probably going to be a common thing that comes up. So now what Katie and I are working on is once an investor invests and their funds have settled in our escrow account, sending an email, that kind of timeline for what to expect next. They do receive confirmation, you know, that their funds have been received, that they've invested in 7E, but what now? So, you know, putting together, Katie and I, again, kind of putting our heads together and working on an email that we're able to go through and send to investors that says, hey, thank you for investing within the next, you know, seven days, here's what to expect within the next two weeks, here what's, here's what to expect, and then month even, and then here's when you'll be receiving your first dividend. And I think, I don't know of many, again, I've invested in other asset classes, other funds, and I've never had that level of like transparency into like, here are the next steps. And you're not just like, we're taking your money and then we'll send you a dividend. There's that constant communication that is going on and that, I guess, openness to feedback as far as what we can do better. Chris, do you have anything to add? I could keep going. This is my jam. No, I was going (laughs) to jump in because we're talking a little bit about our internal team, but I also don't want uh, to single out them because we also have the external team where we know our expertise. And we've seen other regulation offerings where people tried to do many things on their own. For example, we brought on one, the lar- I think they're the largest broker dealer involved with Regulation A plus offerings, Dalmore Financial. We brought on a technology company that does the Invest Now button that teamed with Dalmore to get that process of clicking on the button and getting your investment, that process, and make that a smooth transition to get invested in the offering. And then all the way to the end of getting into our system and then issuing the shares where we have a transfer agent as well as part of this whole process. And again, seeing other Regulation A offerings, try and do all of that themselves. And that is something that we looked at. And you mentioned about the number of investors and others may get overwhelmed because they're trying to take on all that responsibility. We know what we're good at and we know who the experts are in our fields. So we want to bring them in and team with them and really create that specialty team. And I'll go back to football analogy of between special teams, offense and defense. Now, one person can't do it all. And we make sure that we have the right players at all times on the field. Yeah. And I actually, at this last conference, hosted a panel on the use of technology in today as an investor, as running a fund, like how are you utilizing technology? Mm -hmm. And it's just so interesting to me because with all of the technology that we have, not just social media, but just technology in general and how quickly it's advancing. <laughs> Man, I'm having a hard time with my words this morning. How quickly it's advancing. And newer investors or people who are new to alternative investing, they want more, like expect more transparency and communication into what's going on. What do I expect? What is my investment doing? And I think that's something that we're kind of ahead of the game on when it comes to providing our investors, not only with here's what to expect in the next few weeks, but then ongoing quarterly reports as to here's how the fund is doing, maybe some stories. Again, if anyone is listening to this, that is an investor right now, what do you want to see? We know what we've done in the past, but again, people are starting to want to see different things. So I can talk about we are going to show you how the fund's doing, your how you know your distributions and contributions and where you are financially. But mm-hmm. one thing we've kind of tossed around, would, would it make sense to show like a story of one of the borrowers we've worked with, whether mm-hmm. that was a loan modification or would that be something people want to see? And I would say yes. And I think maybe it's something that we might try. And But I think really having the team that is looking to really get that feedback from investors. So again, if you're on this call and you are an investor, feel free to shoot Katie an email or myself, and it would be katie at 7einvestments.com. Oh, that kind of leads into, we did get two questions. One is, can a LLC invest in 7e? Yes. An LLC, a self-directed IRA, any type of entity or individual can invest in the offering. So I want to mention that. And then the other question kind of just led right where you said is, do we post quarterly financial reports? We will provide quarterly reports to investors. We also do have to, on public record, provide the SEC, Security and Exchange Commission, a semi-annual report and annual audited financials. So as we always talk, one of the things that I've always, you know, discussed throughout 
200 plus podcast episodes between my notes and offerings and prior funds has been transparency. And we do want to maintain that transparency. And in the past, I think I've done a very good job in keeping people up to speed on what is going on and you know the goings and happenings within the company. Yeah. I didn't even see that question when I was talking about our quarterly reports. So mm-hmm. you kind of touched on that and then on the SEC financials that we need to post. So I mean, Chris, is there anything else when it comes to the investor experience that you've noticed or that you heard kind of either from the conference or as an investor yourself that you find is important? A lot of the people we talk to really were very interested in what we were doing because they've had a lot of struggles with some of their offerings and were asking us, well, how are you doing this or how are you doing that? And I think two of the biggest, those were two main questions. And the response has been your team internally and externally, and really focused on building that team of having the right people on the team and not just bringing in 25 people to come work for you to say you have 25 employees that don't have that key experience or bringing a lot of people in who might have just been recent grads or only two, three years experience. We've got our staff is on IR and never else, 10, 15 years of corporate experience and working and understanding you no know, business culture and how to function in a business. And one of the things that you know, from our retreat that we were talking about prior to this call was how well everyone gets together because everyone has a very similar mindset and has that corporate experience and knows what it's like to work in that corporate environment while working you know, together, but also remote and understanding how to communicate between internal and the externally. Yeah. And so I guess since we're on the call and I kind of mentioned this, like, Chris, can you talk about a time that you did a, like, can you talk about one of the kind of, we talked about this double bottom line, the Mm -hmm. returns for the investors and the second chance for borrowers. I guess, Mm -hmm. can you talk about some of the second chance for borrowers and like that we've had, that we've been able to, some of the stories that we've had, some of the success stories, I'll call them. Yeah, there's lots of them. You know, just last week, we've worked out a a plan with a borrower. Now that we've worked it out, now we have to continue to constantly work with the borrower because there's really three components that I'll mention as part of this process. The first is the default where a borrower, for, you know, for some reason stops making their payments. And we will look into what was that cause, especially when we're going to buy a loan to determine whether this is somebody that we think can be used the term, the loan be rehabilitated. Similar to like buying a dilapidated house, people think it has value, but a discounted value. But if you repair it, bring it back up to livable condition, that has a lot more value. A loan is the same way. If a loan is delinquent and you can bring that loan back to current and work with that loan, it enhances its value. So we'll understand what that default was. And then the communication is the key because what happens when most people get in default, when anyone gets in trouble in anything or has some type of embarrassment, what do they do? They kind of get very closed and they stop answering phones, phone calls, wherever the case may be, because they don't have an answer. And one of the things that we try and do is be proactive with them and treat them in a way of, we're here to work for you. We're not calling you scream, having someone scream at you say, I need your money. It's what can we do? to work out this loan. And I remember five years ago, a borrower called me up and typically we don't talk to the borrowers. I think something to just kind of jump in there for a second was you said we don't talk to the borrowers, but I just want to clarify why we don't talk to the borrowers. Yep. And so that's we, not because we don't want to. No. It is, go ahead. I'll let you take that. Yeah. We use third-party servicing companies because of licensing issues. Again, hire companies that this is all they do and they're experienced at is because every statement has to have certain language that goes out the door. When you send statements, when you can make phone calls, all of how many phone calls you can make, all of that stuff is regulated and it's state by state. It's not universal throughout the United States. Each state has different laws. So we hire companies that are licensed specifically in that state to do that. In this instance, a borrower did call me and I was having a conversation with him and, and I asked him, what are you proposing? What can you afford? What you can work with? Because I can throw out numbers. And I told him this, I could throw out numbers and I could, you can yes me to death, but it's not going to get either one of us where we want to be at the end of the day. You know, can you fill out a financial package 
you know, see what you can afford. And we're going to try and work with you on a payment plan. There's something that's reasonable and affordable. And what happens in many instances, and I'm not sure a lot of people notice, and this was something that was very evident back during the downturn. It's changed slightly by larger banks because I think they were kind of pushed by the government on this. But in the past, if you missed a payment, the bank would say, nope, I'm not accepting one. Now you're going to make both. I don't have both. And then another month goes by. Now you need three. Another month goes by. Now you need four. And the borrower might be like, well, I can afford two. They'd be like, nope, all or none. And to me, that just, A, seems a little bit ridiculous. But for us as lenders, we can work with people in regards to, okay, let's take the two. And then what we'll do is maybe we'll extend the loan by two months at the end. Or if some loans might be 15, 18, three years behind. We can push those loans or re-amortize the loan with the same payment to get those fees pushed or moved back to a different position in the loan. And that is kind of a common practice, I'd say, of what we try and do is, again, get these borrowers. First, we do a trial payment plan, which is, okay, let's try this for three months or six months. And if we can get them on a plan for a six-month plan after that, then yes, we would then go to modify their loan, which is essentially, I'll use the term, you know, giving them a new loan. I mean, it's the existing loan, but just restructuring the terms. Yeah. And this kind of ties into, and I know we did a whole podcast episode on this. So if you're interested in this, feel free to take, listen to that. It's called the three-dimensional approach to note investing. And this kind of ties into like, we look at the three P's, like property, the person and the position and Mm -hmm. the person, I feel like I'd say most funds. And again, I'm not talking bad about other funds. I'm just kind of saying, based on my experience, most people look at the property and the position and the person is kind of the last thing that's looked at, but we really, we really emphasize looking at all three pretty equally to come up with a solution to help them stay in their homes, or maybe they don't want to stay in their homes. That's actually happened too. And I think sometimes people look at that as a bad thing, but we've had borrowers. I mean, Chris, you can probably give an example where mm-hmm. people are like, no, it doesn't make sense. You know, especially over the last two years, I have all this equity. I can sell the home mm-hmm. or, and that's a win-win for both us as investors and our investors and mm-hmm. them as well. So do you have oh, any the, examples like that? Yeah. yeah. Home needs a lot of repairs. The home, unfortunately, the borrower will say, hey, I've only been able to really afford the mortgage payments and I've been able to make them. I've missed some on occasion and so forth. And I've gotten, I've fallen behind and I can't afford the upkeep on the house. I can't afford maintaining it. What can we do to try and liquidate this? In some instances, if there was upside down equity, we might even approve a short sale on a property, which is sold for a little less than the legal balance. I want to be clear, we'd still make sure we're making profits on those deals because we're buying at a discount. But if borrower owed 150000 and we paid 100000 for that, instead of spending $10,000 in legal costs and waiting a year, if they can turn around and sell that for $130,000 in you know, 60 days, two things. One is we make a return, but also we're minimizing our risk because we're going back to that other P of property where we don't see the insides of these properties and the potential risk that could be involved by holding on to this for a long period of time. So that's another avenue that we've seen in the past. Sometimes it might be a rental property where they've had tenant issues and they just don't want to own it. And again, they'll turn around and sell it. There's other issues where there's a death in the family. We have one right now where, unfortunately, the borrower passed away. The family is like, hey, we don't want this house. We can't afford it. What do we do? So we're working with the family on a way to liquidate. Yeah. And which is interesting. Another question just came through. And guys, feel free. This is a live podcast. So if you have questions, drop Mm -hmm. them in the Q&A. And if we see them, Mm -hmm. we'll answer them. If a borrower defaults, does 70 sell the home? Do you renovate it first? Do you hold the property and rent it? It's funny. We talked a lot about this this weekend, or I know Chi, who is on our asset management team, talked a lot about it this weekend. So Chris? So speaker of our other asset manager, Delaney, we have been working, we just updated one of our financial models to incorporate what is in our best interest. If the borrower defaults and we get the property back, do we renovate it? Do we hold it for rent it? We run all of this through a financial model. It's a risk-adjusted model to determine what is our best course or avenue. I will say over the last 12 to 18 months or probably 24 months, the you know the financial model says sell it as it is because if anyone's tried to sell a property, even ones that need a renovation, fix and flippers have a hard time finding property. Investors are finding a hard time finding property. There's been low inventory on the market. Construction costs are 
you know, labor and materials have gone through the roof. Yeah. So, so what been, we would have done last year probably is not, might not be the same this year is yeah. kind of what you're saying. Yeah. So what we've done in the past is we've, you know, liquidated, but if all of a sudden prices start to soften and the private money gets a little more difficult to get, we might renovate it first. It could be in an area that we want to hold it as a rental because of our basis makes it very appealing. And especially in you know major metropolitan areas, which typically do have that continued appreciation. So it's not a one size fits all. We go through it just think with notes. When we buy a pool of notes, I just want to mention this and Lauren's like, oh my God, he keeps going. Oh um, no, it's good. It's good. So, cause this question comes up too. Like if we're buying 500 notes, you know, do we look at every single one? And the answer is yes. We will analyze, and there's some that we may throw out as you get to very large funds, and we're talking hundreds of millions of billions of dollars. They're buying thousands of loans and they're kind of just analyzing it as a overall numbers and portfolio, not looking at every single loan. We yeah. look at every single loan, every single loan gets run through a financial model, not only when we acquire it, but also we run it through models um, when we're trying to do modifications or workouts with the borrower. And then if we take it back, it's running through another model of the liquidation strategy. Yeah. I love spreadsheets. So I think that, you know, something that you just kind of touched upon is we're not, there's no like one size fits all for mm -hmm. what we do, both on the acquisition and the disposition. Mm -hmm. And that's what's kind of unique about, again, what we do is we look at the three P's, the person, the property, and the position. We don't say, okay, if the, if X, then Y. And I know, mm -hmm. you know, Chris, you brought up Delaney. And we were talking about this, like, what is she built? Like a huge, what do you call it, a tree? Financial? Built everything. And everything. <laughs> she has. For models she built a and, lot of our processes. Yeah, but, processes and models. You know, I, I'm the not, one that usually builds most of the models because I just love geeking out on Excel. So. Yeah. But, you know, we were talking about it. And it's not always as easy as a, if the A, then B, because there could mm -hmm. be some other factor that we need to consider. So, mm -hmm. you know, like Chris said, we are always looking at, every single loan, not just looking mm -hmm. at the pool of loans mm -hmm. as a kind of singular asset. And and not only that, but even two loans that may look similar, this goes back to that first P of people. We'll look at, you know, I'll just take two loans in Florida and a loan where a borrower may have a history of filing multiple bankruptcies versus a borrower who hasn't versus a borrower who may have had a recent death in the family and it could be the same loan amounts, same origination, same everything else is the same. It could be even the same property, same community, house A, B, and C right next to each other. Just using that as examples, each one would still be looked at differently because of that P. And I think that of people, and I think that is one thing that definitely separates us from others is people look at the position of where the note is, but also mm -hmm. the property. And let's say, again, Florida, California, some of these places where they build a lot of these track homes, just as an example, if they're all track homes in the same community, we would look at every single one individually because of that other P, which I do think is a differentiator. Yeah, for sure. So I guess kind of to tie it all back, do you have any final thoughts or? I thought you were We covered a lot. We yeah, covered we did a cover lot. a lot. Yeah. We kind of started with what you're investing in, not only that 8%, but also mm -hmm. what is your money going towards? Like our, mm -hmm. is this company just going and taking back homes? No, you know, we are really working mm -hmm. with borrowers to find a solution that mm -hmm. allows both us mm -hmm. both to pay investors and give them a second chance. So I think we went from that and then we talked about the investor experience and all that goes into that and our team and the systems behind that, which are so important. And then some case studies. So I guess, do you have any final thoughts for people today? Uh, not throwing you on the bus, but if people oh. do have, yeah. If people do have questions, you know, make sure to reach out to our investor relations team. Like that I was said, gonna, I was going to say that. So that I'm was just, my final thought. I know. That's why I'm like, <laughs> you know, using your final thoughts. But for people who want, I think for investors, one of the things that we enjoy is investors who are educated in what we do and understand this process. I have been in real estate 25 plus years and note investing. It took me several years through my career to even knew this type of thing existed from, and you know, knew it was private money. So a lot of people don't understand note investing or didn't know that it's out there. And we have podcasts out there. We have the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast, which was pr previously the Good Deeds Note Investing podcast. And that was me sharing a lot of the stories and history and lessons learned, the bumps in the road that we've taken. Every investor goes through the good, the bad, the ugly, 
And you learn the most from some of those situations that are harder. And we share that with people. We're transparent on all of these things. And that's something that we continue to share with all investors. Oh man, now I feel like I have a whole nother podcast episode we could talk about now because of where you just went. So we'll save it for another episode, but I will kind of riff off of that for a second. So, I mean, you said it, educating investors. And I think that's something that anyone who's listening now or interested in investing, but wants to know more about us, the team, how we work with borrowers. There's what, over 200 plus episodes prior to me even joining the podcast that are specifically about no investing, stories of things that went well, things that were unexpected. One of the reasons that we started this specific type of offering was to make an alternative investment open and available to pretty much anyone. And something I've been realizing along this journey is that's great that we want to do that. But I also think a big part of what makes us different is we have all this education available for people who may not have invested in any sort of alternative investment, but might be interested, but don't know it's a possibility. So like Chris said, we have the podcast, we have our Facebook group, which is all about notes and people kind of asking questions and looking for support in their note investing journey. We have our YouTube channel, we host monthly webinars. So if you're just interested in kind of learning more about this space or about you know us and what we do, yes, we have a fund and we raise money for that fund, but we also are a big passion of both of ours is really providing that education so people have access. So on that note, if you do have any questions or you are interested in investing in a company that really works towards that double bottom line of returning the returns for the investors and the second chance for borrowers, feel free to reach out to me directly at Lauren, that's L-A-U-R-E-N at seven, the number eInvestments.com. I'd be happy to jump on a call, answer any questions you might have and see if it makes sense for you. So I was going to just mention, there are a few questions that are in the chat that just popped through, but those are a little long-winded answers that we'll respond separately to those because... Yeah. So I think Kevin and VJ, you just sent us some questions that Chris and I will reach out to you directly and respond to. And Mm -hmm. We have also, I think, addressed in previous podcast episodes, Mm -hmm. or maybe that's just this weekend because that question came up a lot from the conference we were at. It was probably every other second. So thank you guys again for joining us today on this live episode of the CWS podcast. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, subscribe to the show, or leave us a review. Until next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you for joining Lauren and I on this episode of the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast. Each week, we bring you expert education, experience, and information in a digestible format to help you identify investment opportunities so you can build wealth through real estate and take action toward your financial goals. Enjoy the show, share with a friend or subscribe to the show, and leave us a review. 